darlings. Good morning, darlings. Okay, so today what we're going to do is before we get into the ins and outs and the technicalities of going through the next poem, which is London, we're going to have a synopsis. I'm going to walk you through the ins and outs of what's actually going on. Quite a few people get um, they get tripped up on this because there's quite a few words in here that are alien to us in the present day. And so we've not really come across them before. So what we, I thought we'd do is make sure that we know what is happening, what the plot of the poem is, rather than just go straight in with the method analysis, because it's pointless going for the deeper analysis where we're literary archaeologists if we don't know what's going on up at a basic level. Now, before this piece of work, I gave you two tasks to do. I gave you um, two images of London to write about. I gave you the nice shiny version of the modern day London, and I gave you the Victorian version. The nice shiny version of London, where we think it's vibrant and energetic and it's wealthy, it's got loads of culture, which by the way, when lockdown's over and everything's safe again, I highly advise that you go to London because if you haven't been, it's such a worthy, worthwhile trip. There is so much in terms of museums and culture and history and just stuff about Britain in, in, you know, and then the rest of the world as well, actually. We've got some fantastic collections in the art galleries and we, we you know, it's just amazing. So it's well worth a trip. So we had the nice shiny sparkly London and we also had the Victorian London, which we generally associate more with hard times which was a dickens novel which is so good and you should read it with poverty with extreme conditions that we see in a christmas carol and blake this dude here who wrote this poem wrote about that okay so that's what we're going to look at today so he says i wandered through each chartered street near where the chartered thames does flow and mark in every face i meet marks of weakness marks of woe now you'll notice first of all that we've got these apostrophes here these uh emissive apostrophes which means that they have missed out letters uh, as part of that word so here we know that we should have a ugh and here we should know we should have an e for each of these words now it doesn't matter that he has um, abbreviated these because quite often the Victorians did things like this, especially in poetry, because it helps the, um, the, the number of beats per line. And we'll come to that later and we'll definitely come to that when we do Romeo and Juliet because it's significant there as well. So essentially what's going on in this stanza? We've got the speaker, so the I, the first person, remember we did this um, with uh, Ozymandias, the first person narrator um, wandering through each designated street of London. So this is almost like the word mapped or chartered. Chartered means designated. This is this street, this is that street. Designated can also mean named, of course. Uh, okay, so if you didn't know that, Get that down on your copy. It's in the shared area. I should have said that before. Uh, near where the chartered Thames does flow. So the walk then brings the speaker near the River Thames, which also seems to have its course dictated for it as it flows through the city. So this is almost like it's dictated. That's it. That's a D, darling. Okay, dictated. So it's almost forced to go where the humans want it to go to. Okay, right. So that's essentially, so he's walking around London and he's going near the Thames, the river. If you've not seen the River Thames, it's brilliant. What you need to do is you need to do the touristy thing. You need to stand on Tower Bridge and have one foot on one half of the bridge and the other foot on the other half of the bridge and look down at the little gap in between where the bridge rises. It's so cool. It's really cool. It makes you a bit dizzy though, I will warn you. Okay, so uh, the speaker then in this bit here, and every in and mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. So here he's seeing signs of resignation and sadness in the person of every um, in the, the face of every person he sees. So this is all about sadness, okay? And this mark here means recognize. I mark in every face I meet, I recognise or I see in every face I meet marks of weakness and marks of woe. And these are more like actual marks rather than um, 
I'm going to try and make this word go massive because I, I drew me, I drew me arrows too small. Okay, marks of weakness and marks of woe. Weakness here meaning resignation, meaning, uh, and then this bit here meaning sadness. So immediately we see that this is a, a, a sad tone. Yeah, we've, we've got a sad poem here. This isn't a happy poem. This is a sad poem. We're confronted immediately with the idea of it being he's he's seeing sadness all around okay now in every cry of every man in every infant's cry of fear um in every voice in every ban the mind forged manacles i hear so there should be an apostrophe there if we're talking about it you know specifically but whatever. Okay, so in every cry of every man, what he's saying, he's saying he's hearing the pain and sadness as well, because men are crying and newborn babies are crying because they're fearful. Every voice in the city is crying. Everyone is crying. It's all miserable. Let's make sure we know how to spell miserable, please, guys. In every law, so ban here, if you don't know what the word ban means, so like you can have a ban on something, um, like in my classroom we have a ban on the S word, obviously, we also have a ban on chewing gum and that is the law in my classroom, so if you have a ban there, it can also mean, uh, like when you have your bans read at, at uh, church, it can also mean the law that you are intended to marry and if, if you are going against the law by being a bigamist, for example, you would be breaking the law, so in every law, then in every law that's made that is the weirdest w i have ever written in my entire life we'll try that again in every law that's ever been written or that's been written he hears the um oppression of city life this mind forged manacles this bit here the oppression well, what does oppression mean? It means a lack of freedom, okay? The oppression of city life. Why have they got a lack of freedom? Well, probably because they don't have much money. Conditions in London in the Victorian era were pretty awful for quite a lot of people. This is something you'll look at for your contextual detail, detail later on. Um, but for now, that's all you need to hear. You need to know about these particularly uh, particular two lines okay uh okay let's move on so how the chimney sweepers cry every blackening church appalls and the hapless soldiers sigh runs in blood down palace walls okay it's quite a lot going on here so he hears the cry of young chimney sweepers now what do we know about young chimney sweepers these are probably children well done I heard you saying that, well done, because children were the ones who could get up the chimneys because they were thin enough to get up there, they were small enough to get up there. Yes, they were grown up, um, they were grown up chimney sweepers, um, probably Bert from Mary Poppins doesn't quite count, but there were um, chimney sweepers who were older, however, they did used to employ children, we all know this because we, we just do, we've learned this in school. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls. So he's saying this brings shame on the church authorities. What he, that's what he's saying, shame on church authorities. And we'll come back into that later on when we do our proper analysis about what he's saying, what his message is. And the hapless soldiers sigh, He's thinking of British soldiers, soldiers dying in vain. Here, um, hapless, meaning almost helpless, or there's nothing they can do for their situation. And here he's thinking of, he, he's imagining their blood running down palace walls. He's imagining it. Um, of a palace okay we'll come back to what that means when we do a deeper insight into this but this is genuine generally what he's thinking of okay this speaker but most of all though he's seeing that the speaker hears the cry of young prostitutes a harlot is a prostitute that's how you spell that word yes 
um, how the young form harlots curse and they swear at their situation. There's a scene in the West Wing where they talk about whether or not it should be legal and the most um, significant argument is that no young girl decides when she's little that that's what she wants to grow up and be. Most people, most women turn to it out of desperation. Okay, so we'll come back to that when we do a deeper analysis. Um, and then it says, in, so essentially blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. This is the end of the poem. And what it's saying is this miserable sound of her um, swearing and crying um, brings their newborn children to tears as well because a side effect of prostitution was children that they would have children because they would become pregnant okay um he also imagines this um, sound plaguing what the speaker calls a marriage hearse um which carries so a marriage hearse which carries love and death uh together and we'll come back to this this idea of a marriage hearse and the fact that the plague here has a significant um, meaning as well. But essentially that's what he's seeing. He's seeing the negative side of London. He's not seeing the positives because he's saying that he can't find any. Um, that's an eye. And, he's, and this is a poem to make the people who don't normally see this aware of it. Where have we seen stuff like that before? We've seen it with A Christmas Carol. This is what people of the time who were writers used to do because they were the only people who could take up the cause of those who were downtrodden, of those who were oppressed. The writers of the time were like the pop and rock stars of today. They were the ones who were speaking for others. They were the ones who were trying to change society. If you wanted to be famous back in the day, you better be a good writer because that's how people, don't forget there were no working TVs. So people read, that's what they did. They read for fun because reading is fun and you should all be doing more of it. But this is what they did. If you wanted to be a rock star and you wanted to change the world, you wrote a book, you wrote a novella, you wrote a poem. This is what you did. Or you wrote a song with, with provoking, thought provoking lyrics. Okay, so if you can make these notes, please, in really tiny, not nearly as big as I've done, really tiny um, in pencil um, handwriting on your copies, then we will be all set up for the more in-depth look at when we look at the methods and all of that good stuff. Okay, and that's the end of today's lesson. If you've got any issues, you know you can email me, you know where I am. You can tweet me at Miss Hine English because nobody does have it anymore because you all email me. This works in the shared area, so you'll be able to have your copy of the poem there. Okay, stay safe and I'll see you soon. Bye.